Ja, ein herzliches Willkommen. Ich begrüße Sie zu unserer heutigen Portfolio Manager Konferenz. Mein Name ist Florian Koch. Ich bin Senior Investment Analyst bei Scope. Wir wollen uns heute das Segment der Schwellenanleihe, an, Schwellenländeranleihen näher anschauen und ähm, die Relation im Vergleich zu den herkömmlichen Anlie Anleihen bietet für Investoren immer noch einen Renditeaufschlag. Alleine im Monat Mai haben ausländische Investoren fast 10 Milliarden US-Dollar in Schwellenländer investiert. In Schwellenländer Aktien hingegen sind bereits nur 4 Milliarden US-Dollar geflossen. Wir schauen uns daher das Segment etwas genauer an und fragen, welche Länder aus welchen Schwellenländern let letztendlich weiter interessant sind. Wir haben heute einen Schwellenländer-Experten eingeladen. Wir begrüßen heute Joseph Murawa. Er managt einen Rentenfonds von Kamjak, der ausschließlich in Schwellenländer, Schwellenländer investiert. Bevor wir starten mit dem Vorpart, zunächst noch einige kurze Informationen zu Kamjak. Ähm, Kamjak wurde 1989 von Eduard Kamjak gegründet und verwaltet ein Vermögen von ca. 39 Milliarden Euro. Ähm, derzeit arbeiten fast 300 Mitarbeiter für das Unternehmen. Davon sind 43 Fondsmanager oder Analysten. Und das Unternehmen managt 24 Anlagestrategien in den Bereichen Aktien, Renten, Misch- und Dachfonds. Und Kamjak ist in insgesamt 16 Ländern aktiv. So, Joseph, my first question to you is to you and your position. So, Just give us a quick introduction to your position, your role, and your company, please. Sure. Good morning, everyone. Thank you for this uh, introduction. Um, yes. Yeah, so, um, just to briefly, so I'm, I'm Joseph Mawad. I've joined uh, Kaminiak in in 2015. Uh, I've been responsible since then of all the emerging markets fixed income um, investments. Uh, in the firm, so this is true of the pure pure emerging markets um, funds, but also of the more global funds, which which have some emerging market strategy in in them. Um, we've launched the the fund that we're about to talk talk about, Kamenyak EM Debt, in 2017. Um, But the strategy exists since 2015. It's the same strategy that we've been running uh, for, for, for almost six years now. Um, and, and, and basically, we've isolated that strategy since 2017 to propose it as part of a, of a new fund. And that's the Kaminiak EM debt fund that we will uh, be discussing. If we. Okay. Yeah. Yes, uh, then I would say we just switch to the presentation and on our first slide. So as you stated, um, these are some fun facts. I will switch to German for a second. Um, the four wurde in July 2017 aufgelegt. Derzeit sind wir bei ungefähr 66 Millionen US-Dollar, die in dem Fonds angelegt sind. Der Fonds kann in Staats- und Unternehmensanleihen anlegen und dabei kann er auch letztendlich in lokalen bzw. auch in Hard Currencies allokieren. So, Joseph, um, from your experience, are more institutional or retail clients invested in the fund? Um, so, so, so this is a, a quite mixed fund uh, where you have a lot of um, retail. You could, you know, this is an asset class where that interests at the same time institutionals, uh, but also retail, especially these type of, of uh, the, the fund that Cognac EM Debt that you mentioned uh, has a dual mandate of of you know, delivering over the investment period a positive return as well as to beat the reference indicator, which is the, the JP Morgan um, uh, GBI EM debt index. Uh, and because of this dual mandate, it's, it's actually something that interests also the retail clients, which are more sensitive to absolute performance uh, in, the, in the shorter run. Uh, and I think this dual mandate makes this uh, a product interesting uh, to retail as well as, as institutionals. Okay, this is very interesting. So as we can see on the next slide, so the fund is very convincing in respect to the return and also to the risk parameters like sharp ratio. We see a very short horizon, a long horizon and since launch. So the fund is always in the first percentile or quartile and also the sharp ratio is very excellent. So I would say it's really worthwhile to speak about the fund strategy. And um, Joseph, when journalists report on emerging countries, the name Lebanon, Zambia, or Sri Lanka um, coming there, coming in their mind, but um, they are very, they are offering very high returns per year. But I don't think that these are the countries you have in your focus. So, 
from your point of view, why investors should invest into emerging markets? And um, do you think um, that the arguments for the next months and years would become more worthwhile to invest in this uh, region? That's a good question. Yes, I mean, um, you know, there there are multiple reasons why why we should be considering EM debt today. Um, I think the first one, and and I'm sure you know us in in continental Europe, in, you know, in the eurozone, where we're very well aware of what what is going on. There, there's a global financial repression happening uh, today, in, in, at least in the developed world we're seeing that 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 the yields that we get are are negative in absolute terms in europe um but once we adjust for inflation they become very negative in real terms um everywhere in the developed market so even in the us where interest rates are not negative but once you adjust by inflation it, it is a very very uh, hard financial repression environment for bond investors. And I think this is where EM contrasts with that because EM offers us a universe where we still have very interesting yields and very interesting real yields um, once we adjust of, uh, of inflation. And, and this is key for us uh, as, as fixed income investors. It's, it's important to make sure that your purchasing power is not getting eroded with time. The second point that, that is quite interesting is, is also the policy mix in the developed world and, and more specifically in the United States um, that is becoming extremely loose. I mean, you know, when we look at the, the, the deficit trajectory and, and the spending trajectory um, uh, of, of, the, of, the, of the United States government, and we at the same time look at the policy that the Federal Reserve is adopting, uh, th this is conducive to a very weak uh, dollar. Um, and this is something that, that, that tends to benefit emerging markets. And these are typically cycles that are three to five year long, where the dollar loses about 30, 40% of its value. We've had three of these cycles in the last 50 years. And, and we're, we think that we're at the beginning of such a cycle today and emerging markets will benefit a lot from that and the last point i want to mention so of course to go back to to to, to your initial thoughts you mentioned sri lanka lebanon etc when thinking about emerging markets and i know that sometimes people tend to think about these stories but in reality emerging market bond universe is a very large and very diverse uh, uh, universe um, and, and, and in reality, you know, it, it contains, for example, the China local currency bond market, which is the second largest market in the world after the U.S. government uh, debt market. So, so the second largest bond market, larger than, than Italy's or, or any European uh, bond market. Uh, you have the China local currency bond market and is one that is, that is quite interesting because of the... the, the, the um, the real interest rates that that they provide but of course you also have the corporate sector in em you have the the dollar or euro denominated uh a bond universe so you can have some some peruvian retailer bonds or you can have some african uh, countries bonds so so you you have a, a very wide and very diverse bond and our job is to find the right opportunities in the right places Okay, this is very interesting, but um, we should also speak about the timing. So would you say this is the right timing to start an investment into emerging market bonds or would you prefer um, just to wait for a better opportunity? No, I mean, th this is also a, a good question. I, I touched a little bit on that, on the timing issue when I mentioned the policy mix in the United States. And I, and I think, it, it, you know, from a timing perspective, it is, it is really the right time uh, to, to invest and you can see that traditionally historically the performance of EM assets whether it's equities or OFX or, or, or any basically EM uh, asset performance it is, is highly correlated with the growth of exports or with, with, the, with the changes in commodity prices 
Now, as you can see on the right hand side, and, and EM exports and commodity prices are generally quite linked. And we can see that, that you know, given the, the policy mix that is happening today in the world, given the competition on infrastructure that the United States and China are, are, are having, um, and, and we've seen recently with the G7, the drive to, to, to start up a new Belt and Road initiative you know, to, to mimic the Chinese uh, uh, Belt and Road uh, uh, initiative of investment in infrastructure. So all of this investment will be uh, conducive to higher exports and higher commodity prices in a way, and that tends to be very favorable uh, for emerging markets. Okay. Um, you have already mentioned the, the U.S. So last week, the U.S. Central Bank was discussing the first interest rate increase in 2023. But some members do expect the first increase already in 2022. So increasing interest rates in developed countries do normally affect emerging markets negatively. So why do you think this is not the case anymore? Well, that's another good question. And, and the s simple answer is that there is actually no real correlation between interest rates in the developed countries or, or the US and emerging markets. Yes, when we think about higher US rates, we our memory tends to go to 2018. And you can see on the chart in, in the, the zones that are colored red, we think about 2018 or we think about the infamous uh, taper tantrum in 2013, where you had higher US rates and EM uh, assets um, and, and returns were, were, were uh, underperformed and, and did poorly in, the, in that time. But in reality, if you look over a, a slightly longer history, you can see periods in, 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 during which, you know, and this is true of, of, of 2003 all the way to 2007, but also 2009 to 2010, you have periods where you have rising interest rates uh, in the US while EM does extremely well. And, and the reality is that the, 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 what matters here is to see whether there is the Federal Reserve tightening uh, too much relative to uh, uh, um, the state of the, eco of the global economy relative to what is happening uh, on the inflation front or is the Federal Reserve just playing catch up with the growth and inflation in the world? And we think we're more in that type of environment. Uh, and this, this type of environment is usually the post-crisis environment. You know, in, in, in 2002, 2001, 2002, we had the dot-com uh, crisis. In 2008, we had, the, the, of course, the great financial crisis. And, and of course, in 2020, we had the, the COVID-led uh, crisis. And, and usually in these post-crisis eras, uh, um, you know, the, 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 there, there will be a lot of spending and we can certainly see that happening in, in, in all over the developed world. And, and therefore, the federal the rates will rise because inflation is rising. And, and if, it's, if it's playing catch up with inflation, it, it, then we're more in an environment that is similar to 2000 three to 2007 or 2009, 2010, rather than similar to taper tantrum or to, to 2018 uh, um, period. Okay, this is very interesting. Um, for now, it's, uh, I would say we just move to the fund strategy. So and as I stated before, Joseph, you are one of the fund managers. James Planning is your colleague or your co-manager. But as we can see, there are some more teams and some more people who are, could, might be involved into the strategy. Maybe you can just say one or two sentences to the most important persons um, from the credit team or from your team to give us an impression how the team is working. Yes, uh, sure. So, of course, uh, James Planning and myself, we are focused on emerging market sovereign. Um, debt and sovereign fixed income. Um, and we sit part of Rose Waba's team who, who runs the, the global fixed income uh, team. Of course, we interact with, with the whole team in terms of, of, of understanding the macro environment and, and what is happening to the overall dollar, what is happening to overall 
interest rates. So we have to interact with the whole team quite well. But more specifically, we interact with two specific teams, and that's Pierre Verlet's credit team. Um, uh, and, and, and this team um, basically looks after all the micro side of our investments. So, so the EM debt fund has a lot of sovereign, but also has some allocation to credit, to, to, to corporate credit, I should say. And the way this works is that Pierre Verlet's team and mainly uh, uh, Alexandre de Neuville, which are both AAA CityWire rated as well, uh, um, uh, fund managers, they really select the name and do the, the, the analysis of the businesses because that's not my area of expertise. But in, uh, what, what ends up happening is that we find an intersection between my macro top-down view and their micro bottom-up view in order to select the bonds on the corporate side that is that go into the bond, uh, into the EM uh, debt fund. And of course, we interact a lot with the emerging equity team. I actually co-manage another uh, uh, multi-asset fund with Xavier Ovas. Um, so, so we work with this team very closely. Um, they're, they're, of course, a, a, a little bit, um, you know, they're, they're focused on equities, but they have to work a lot on, on the macro framework of each country and try to understand the risks uh, uh, in, in, in various countries. So it's very important uh, for us to, to, to coordinate and, and we keep a constant dialogue with Xavier and his team uh, that, that cover various areas of, of, of the emerging worlds. Okay. Well, you have already mentioned um, the macro view, the micro view, though maybe it's worthwhile to go to the investment process, which is crucial, the, the heart of each fund. So um, could you please guide us through your investment process? And it's always good to have a concrete example of a country that does uh, fulfill your investment criteria. Maybe you can give us um, some practical experience. So um, why do you say um, this country is worthwhile to invest? Of course. Um, so, you know, as I mentioned, we're, we're you know, we have a, um, we have a very flexible uh, uh, mandate in in our uh, in our uh, pr prospectus, and it's a, a some it's a flexibility that we will be using. Um, and uh, of course, we have I mentioned that briefly already, but we have multiple vectors to 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 find value in the markets. Of course, you have the local debt um, local debt universe so this includes the the chinese local government bond but also you know mexico and and and, and russia and so forth and and this is quite this is usually the the largest and most liquid uh, part of the universe but you also have the external debt strategy so these are bonds that can be issued by by some um by some countries that are generally a little bit smaller uh, because they don't have a, a deep enough local currency market, uh, and, and they, therefore they have to issue in euros or dollar. Um, so, so think about here countries such as Romania, Ivory Coast in Africa, or, or Dominican Republic in the Caribbean. These type of countries where it's uh, um, you know they have to rely on on issuing in euros or dollars. Um, and of course, it, it, within the dollar and euro uh, denominated bonds, you have the corporate world that I just mentioned, where, where Pierre Verlet's team have a large input. And finally, we have to manage the currencies in, in emerging markets. And here we have, a, you know, a, 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 we can talk maybe later about that more specifically, but we have a very simple uh, um, philosophy when thinking about currencies is that we want to deposit in currencies with high positive real interest rates and we want to borrow from currencies with low negative real interest rates it's of course we don't apply this philosophy you know simply with, without uh, without much much work but if i had to define it simply this is how i would define it now, this is, of course, uh, what I've just described, the, the investment universe, and we try to find 
all the right opportunities in, in each asset class and in each region. But of course, this is a very, very large uh, universe. So we have, a, uh, we have a, a process to navigate all of that. And if you go to the next slide, um, you can see that what we do is that we apply two type of filters uh, initially in order to start doing the hands-on analysis of the countries and, and, and I'll talk a little bit about that. So the, the, the first type of filter is we have a systematic type filter. So these are, uh, if you want, some models that look at asset valuation with respect of uh, macroeconomic indicators. And this is a, a first type of filter that allows us, if you want, to, to, to identify what is rich and what is cheap what is expensive and what is could be interesting opportunity to buy now of course th this is and I, i'll give you an example ju just so that you understand what i'm talking about so so we'll we'll tend to look at for example at real interest rates so the interest rates adjusted by inflation uh, of of every single country and we compare that uh, to the core inflation dynamics and we'll tend to find that th this is a variable that that explains the real interest rates and we will identify which countries seem to have interesting real interest rates and here for example you can see countries like uh, china like russia like south africa etc and we will see some that have very negative uninteresting real interest rates like india hungary poland etc now, of course, these, uh, um, uh, this first filter is, is, is just to narrow down the universe of our, uh, uh, and narrow down the, the number of, 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 of uh, opportunities we will be looking at, as opposed to a systematic signal to buy or to sell. At the same time, we have our, our ESG scoring, and we, I think we will talk more about that uh, in a bit. But this is also a, a, a filter and acts as a risk management tool for us uh, because it, it allows us to avoid those that have long-term uh, sustainability or long-term governance issue and therefore more vulnerable to uh, uh, political noise or more vulnerable to crises. Um, and this, uh, so so these two filters basically narrow down our universe in for, as a first step. And then, of course, before deciding whether an investment opportunity is uh, uh, interesting or not, we're going to be doing a lot of hands-on analysis. Uh, so I mentioned, for example, South Africa and, and and Russia, which offer high real interest rates, for example. And, and, and you know, but but we're going to be looking at them. You know, usually we 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 will be talking to uh, local investors. We will be talking to policymakers. We have a this close dialogue with the central banks, with with the finance ministries. We will be talking to political analysts to understand the political and the geopolitical situation. Uh, we're going to be talking to 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 local banks uh, and local experts. Um, and, and of course, uh, uh, economists to try to understand. And then we will make the decision that, okay, for example, Russian rates, they look interesting. And the conclusion can be that would be that, okay, they are interesting, but South Africa could look interesting according to the models. But after doing the hands-on analysis, we decide that it's actually not worth the risk uh, reward that we want, want, want to take. So this is the, the type of, of, of uh, approach that we have. And this allows us to, to, to narrow down our universe and to focus uh, uh, on, on a fewer number of countries as opposed to, uh, uh, to just you know, try to find opportunities and try to f formulate a view on everything. Uh, okay. But as we can see, the fund is also considering ESG criteria in the investment process. So do you use your own scoring method or do you also include external providers here? So, um, yes, as, as you mentioned, we, we this is an Article 9 fund, actually. Um, so, um, yes, if we look at this slide, we, we have actually developed our own ESG scoring. But this ESG scoring relies 
on external data only. So we've published the way this scoring is calculated. And this is something that anyone uh, from the audience or, or anyone that, that goes on our website can recreate that, 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 uh, that scoring. And we try to develop a scoring that is uh, uh, as objective as possible uh, and, and we try not to rely on, on, on politics, uh, political alliances, political systems. We try to take an agnostic view uh, on that and try to rely very little on newspaper headlines and try to, to create a scoring that is very much database. And we use data that is very reliable from, from sources that we trust, such as the, the World Bank, the IMF, um, etc. Uh, and, and, and we use these data. Uh, and the one thing that is actually quite interesting about our, our, our scoring system is, is that, you know, we try to focus much more on changes uh, of various measures as opposed to absolute levels. Because the idea here is twofold. Uh, A, we want to, you know, by focusing on absolute levels, you will be always, you know, giving an advantage to the more developed countries. So, so take, you know, if you think about it, uh, let, let, let's talk about the environment for, for starters. You know, if we look at uh, uh, CO2 emissions per capita, if we look at, you know, share of renewables, um, you know, if we focus on the absolute level of share of free renewables, a country like Norway, for example, or Denmark will end up scoring extremely highly and, and, and lower uh, developed countries will, will end up scoring extremely poorly. Uh, and in reality, investing in, in, in Norwegian debt has a very little impact in terms of ESG and, and we want to focus on the changes. So we've developed a system that, that really focuses on changes. So we're gonna look at on the environment side at CO2 emission per capita changes at share of renewable change. So, so we want we want to reward the countries that are increasing the share of renewables. Um, same thing on the social aspect, we focus on GDP per capita changes. And, 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 and here is, is we 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 focus on the per capita part because you have a lot of countries where you know, like such as Nigeria, for example, that can produce a lot of growth, but in reality, GDP per capita is, is actually falling or, or, or stagnant. And therefore, uh, um, from a social perspective, this is not something that we're, that we're looking for. Again, life expectancy, we're going to be looking at the changes of life expectancy. Are you improving the life expectancy of your population at a faster rate? than the average of the world. And if so, this will be considered as something positive. Um, the Gini coefficient, you know, this is one of the few indicators where we look at the absolute and the change because the Gini coefficient is a measure of inequality. Um, and and, and this, is, this is important for us. Uh, and finally, education, you know, of course, you know, improving the, the quality of your education and the investment in your education is, is also uh, quite key for us when we consider the social aspects uh, of the country. And finally, in, in, t in terms of governance, we, we have here a top-down approach. So instead of focusing on, on, on anecdotes or articles or some some the subjective measures of perception. What we try to do is, is, is we really try to focus, uh, uh, we look at, you know, a top-down aspect. We look at the fiscal position, the debt, the current account, the ease of doing business. And here, the, 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 the reason why we do that is that what we try to do is we try to say, okay, are you improving your environment? Are you improving the life of your society? You know, the, the social aspect while making sure that you are not making it unsustainable from a fiscal position. You are not running very wide deficits that will be unsustainable and will have to be reversed in the future. So it's all about at what cost are you 
uh, 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 managing to do this. So I'll give you an example just to, to so we illustrate our points here. Take Lebanon that you mentioned earlier. So Lebanon post-civil war in the 90s uh, uh, started with almost zero debt because all, all the debt was wiped out. And in the 20 years that followed, you know, like up until 2019, so even forgetting the last two years that were horrendous for the country, if we go back, if we go back to 2019 and we, and we see what happened in the previous decade, we can see that debt rose a lot. So debt rose all the way to 250% of GDP. Current account deficit was almost 25%. Uh, uh, the fiscal deficits were, were, were extremely wide and unsustainable. And at the same time, GDP per capita was stagnating the whole time. The education uh, 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 level was stagnating. The Gini uh, indicators was going up instead of down. Of course, share of renewable had not changed at all also at the same time. So for us, this is a pure example of, 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 of a corrupt system that is building up a lot of debt, a corrupt and inefficient system that is building up a lot of debt, building up a lot of, uh, um, a lot of deficits, but at the same time not improving anything or not improving much on the social side and not improving much on the environment side. And this is why going into 2019, we were actually part of our process quite negative on Lebanon and that turned out to be uh, uh, um, the right view. Uh, on the other hand, if you have a country, let's say, let's say like China, for example, that is improving the share of renewables quite rapidly, that is becoming a leader in solar, in offshore wind, in onshore wind, that is, uh, uh, that is, uh, you know, trying to rein in the CO2 per capita uh, trajectory, and at the same time, the GDP per capita has been increasing so rapidly. They've lifted almost 700 million people from under the poverty line. The median income of, 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 the, of, the, of the middle class has vastly improved. The life expectancy has improved. The ranking in PISA from an education perspective have been extremely rapidly improving uh, um, in China. But at the same time, they are running, you know, decent current account position, you know, fiscal position that's not completely uh, uh, um, uh, not reasonable, you know, debt, uh, debt to revenue is also is quite contained. So this ends up scoring uh, uh, positively. So, so I'm just try trying to give you some examples uh, to illustrate how we're thinking uh, uh, about these issues here. And if you go to the next slide, you'll see how that scoring actually turns out. So here on the, on the, on the X axis, we've put the credit rating. So triple A all the way on the left. And, and, you know, of course the, 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 the less uh, um, good credit, uh, you know, the double Gs and the Cs and the, uh, on the right hand side and our scoring on the Y axis. And this is something that we're actually very happy with. You can see that the correlation between credit rating and the ESG score is, is non-existent. And actually our ESG scoring nicely splits our universe in two uh, sides. You know, it, it, it splits our universe in two. Um, when we look at the level of, of three, which is our, our kind of uh, uh, average level. Um, and, and, and you can see that you have very rich countries such as Qatar, Saudi Arabia, etc., that, that rank poorly, but you also have a, a very poor country that rank well, and you have poor countries that rank poorly, like Argentina, for example, or, or Lebanon that I just mentioned, and you have rich countries that rank well. And, and the same thing would happen if I added developed market countries, you would have a country like Denmark, for example, or even Germany uh, ranking quite well, but you will have the United States uh, uh, rank quite poorly despite their credit rating. Uh, and I think this is the type of impact uh, rating that we want to have uh, 
uh, in our approach when, when considering uh, um, when considering our our, uh, our investment uh, opportunities. Okay, so the best situation would be on, to be on the first quarter for the countries, to be on the left side and above an average of 30 ESG scoring points. So we see that many countries are coming from Asia. So from your experience, is it is it true that Asia is the most worthwhile region to invest for emerging market bonds? Uh, no, you're, you're right to point out that the safest are the, 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 the top left. But I would say for us, the more interesting one are the top right ones, are the ones that have a good ESG score, but that offer decent enough and interesting yields for us as bond investors. Let's not forget that our primary objective as bond investors is to generate returns, right? So, um, you know, this is, this is, this ends up, you know, we, we have, we have to keep that primary objective um, in, in the back of our mind. And of course, if you invest, you know, in a country, you know, like Taiwan or, or, you know, Denmark that I mentioned earlier. I mean, of course, Denmark is not an emerging war market, but, you know, had I put it on this quadrant, it would also be on the upper uh, left-hand side. Then, yes, you're, 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 maybe, you're maybe safe from an ESG perspective, but you're not going to be making any returns. You will be even making negative returns in both the cases of Taiwan or, or Denmark uh, or even, in, you know, like the Czech Republic, etc. Uh, so, so the idea here is, is, is the idea here is to identify bonds that offer decent yields, but where the dynamic is good from an ESG perspective. And of course, we have to do on our side, all the macro analysis work, the political analysis work, because of course, these uh, uh, scoring act as a filter, but they're not a necessary uh, um, a, a necessary uh, flag to buy or to sell, just to be clear. Okay, so the answer is to have a mix or risk adjusted returns, exactly. so which, leads, which leads us to the fact that we should also speak about the performance of the fund. Well, during the last year, the fund has shown a very strong performance. So 2018 was a difficult year for the bond segment, but it was also a very um, challenging year, I would say, for emerging market bonds. Um, and we saw a strong recovery in 2019. But uh, most interesting for me is that the fund is outperforming its reference index starting from February 2020. So what are your, the, your reasons here? Um, yes, so as you mentioned, like, at the end of the day, we're focused on risk-adjusted returns. So, so uh, this is not a, this is a fund, uh, and you mentioned initially uh, our very good ranking in terms of sharp ratio, the returns relative to vol volatility. And I think this is all that we're focused on, whatever the asset class, whether it's it's bonds, local currency, hard currency, or FX. Um, um, and, I, and I think, uh, you know, uh, the outperformance uh, is not due to one specific uh, factor. There's been a, a mixture of, of stories. In, in 2020, um, we were very quick to identify Asia as the winners of this COVID crisis. And, and we were very quick to, to invest in the, in the right Asian uh, bond markets uh, that benefited a lot in 2020 because of uh, uh, because of the way that they've handled the, the COVID crisis, and they were one of the first countries to really uh, uh, control uh, the virus and control the the, the, the pandemic and, and return to to semi-normal uh, uh, life, uh, while while the rest of the world and you know developed or emerging was still struggling to find the, the right balance and the right solution uh, for that. So that, that was in, in 2020. This year, it's, it's been a slightly different uh, type. And we've, we've avoided, we've identified. Uh, so this year, actually, although you can see here on, on, on the uh, 
5% roughly for 2021. This only goes back to the end of May. In reality, we're, we're almost at 4.5% at the moment uh, um, and uh, against a, a reference indicator that is negative again. Uh, and here, our, our outperformance this year has been uh, really to, to identify the, the winners and the losers from this cyclical rotation that is happening. You know, we've mentioned how commodity prices are, are, are going up uh, because of, of the policy mix, because of all the spending, because of the reopening. But at the same time, you have some countries that you really needed to, to avoid, such as Turkey um, uh, and Thailand, uh, you know, that are very heavily reliant on, on international tourism. And this is the part that, that because of the variance uh, um, and the slow vaccination, um, you needed to be able to identify which countries are going to benefit and which countries are going to suffer. Um, and we've done that uh, quite well. And, and we've really identified the fact that we needed to have low duration at the beginning of the year, um, you know, when after the Georgia election, as, 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 as global rates repriced the fiscal stimulus and repriced the reopening. Uh, of the world, so so it's a mixture of of, of macro top down calls and 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 really having the right bottom up uh, uh, um, countries that were that were choosing uh, to invest in and those that were most importantly avoiding or deciding to to even go short, like in the in the case of Turkey uh, at the beginning of the year. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, we should definitely have. To a one sentence regarding the risk parameters of the fund, which is the maximum drawdown, also the recovery periods of the fund. So maybe you just maybe just give us two arguments why the fund is very strong in risk in recovery, and also the maximum drawdown is in comparison to its peer also very low. So maybe you can just give us um, your facts here. Yes, yeah, so I think it's, uh, uh, you know, you mentioned 2018, you mentioned, you know, the, 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 of course, the, this is a fund where that invest in, 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 in some bonds that could be volatile at times. But I think the, the, the interesting part is that we managed to recover the drawdowns in, in less than six months every time there is a drawdown. And I think this is interesting because the, I mean, of course, this is a fund where the recommended holding period is about three years. And our objective from an absolute return perspective is over three years. So we promise to deliver positive returns over three years, but also to beat the reference indicator over three years. And I think the six month timing in terms of recovering of the drawdown is interesting, I think, for, for our uh, um, for our clients and for our investors. And the other thing I want to mention, you mentioned, of course, sharp ratios, and you showed that uh, initially that how we look, uh, you know, how the fund looks extremely interesting from a sharp ratio perspective. Another way to measure it is, is, is to look at the return versus the maximum drawdown. And here we've plotted the, the the maximum drawdown versus the return of the EM debt fund, but also of all the Morningstar uh, uh, categories, the different bond categories that you have in Morningstar, the, the European bond category, the global bond category, and, and the EM bond category. And you can see that in, in terms of return versus maximum drawdown, uh, uh, the EM debt fund is actually much more superior than any of the categories because, yes, the drawdown may be a little bit higher than some of the safer bond categories, but the return you're getting for this for this drawdown is much more interesting. You know, if you look at the flexible bond category, for example, the euro bond category, you're getting a return of almost 1%. Over three years, while uh, uh, while while you're getting a, a, a maximum drawdown of almost ten percent, so the ratio is very bad. And same thing goes for all the other uh, bond categories. And and here the EM debt fund ranks also extremely well uh, from from that perspective. Okay, well, um, on the next slide we find the positioning of the fund. 
So um, I think it would very would be very interesting for the audience to get um, some examples which regions were preferred by you in the past and um, which regions and segments do you prefer for the upcoming months? So maybe you can just uh, give us two facts or arguments here. Yeah, sure. So, I mean, you, you can see that uh, at the moment, the, the duration of the fund is, is, is gone back up. So, so we've, we've avoided having high duration at the beginning of the year when the yields were, were very close to the lows. But recently, as, the, as, as um, you know, U.S. rates have started to stabilize, uh, we, we've also increased our, our duration again in the fund. Um, we still have a general preference, uh, uh, at least in local currency, uh, for Asia. And you can see that in the FX exposure, that, that most of our FX exposure in EM is, is tilted towards Asia. And, and um, actually our local debt uh, um, duration uh, is mainly um in in um in asia um but you can see that it actually uh, inverts when you think when we think about external debt i mean asia external debt uh, yields very little has you know very very small spreads because of the credit uh, rating of the area because of the access saving of the area and this is where on the external debt we're going to prefer uh, places such as uh, EMEA and, and Latin America, EMEA mainly Africa, and 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 in Latin America, uh, you know, we we can find more interesting opportunities on the dollar or euro denominated debt. Um, uh, I, I yes, so I think this is you know i don't know if you have more specific questions but i, I won't go through all, all, all the details but i think in in local currency as i mentioned chinese local government bonds russian local government bonds are, are very uh, interesting they provide high real interest rates it's a very strict central bank very orthodox very orthodox fiscal stance low debt to gdp so we really like those on the external debt I mentioned Romania, we think is, is, is a very interesting country because that will benefit a lot from the new generation EU funds. Um, and, and of course, in, in Latin America, one place that we're, 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 we like an external that is Dominican Republic. So this is of course a tourism oriented uh, country, but is one of the very few uh, heavily reliant on tourism countries that is vaccinating extremely rapidly. Um, and as a consequence, we'll, we'll benefit from returning uh, uh, American uh, tourists and, and European tourists, etc. cetera. Um, so, uh, yeah, I think these are a few examples. Of course, we have, we, have, uh, we generally tend to run 25 to 30 type strategies. So I will not, of course, develop all of them. Um, but, but these are the, the main themes that we have at the moment. Yes, so I would say these are very excellent examples and we don't have any further questions here. So I would say um, we stop here at perfect timing. Uh, thanks Joseph from Kamenjak for his brilliant insights. Ich möchte noch auf uh, zwei Dinge aufmerksam machen. Alle Informationen zu dem heute besprochenen Fonds können Sie kostenlos über den Scope Explorer noch einmal anschauen. Des Weiteren finden Sie dort eine Vielzahl an Tools. Um, wir setzen unsere Webinarreihe weiter fort. Bereits morgen spricht meine Kollegin Barbara Klaus über europäische Aktien und fragt, ob die Kategorie reif für ein Comeback ist. Vielen Dank für Ihre heutige Teilnahme. Thank you, Joseph, for being here. Thank you for your Thank time. You. All the best for you and for your performance. Und ich wünsche Ihnen einen schönen Tag. Sage Tschüss aus Frankfurt und bis bald.